Hello everyone. Here we are with our COVID moment for the youth. <clears throat> well, we made it past Labor Day. This is that time of year we just start looking toward the fall, kind of looking, not looking back too much on the summer because that's past. And now it's time to look for all the exciting things that happen in the fall months here. Mm -hmm. So I hope you're doing well. I hope you're getting adjusted to school and the at home learning again. Now today I want to go back to the 21st chapter of John where we were last week. And I know you all remember last week's message with much clarity here. You remember how the disciples had gone out fishing all night long and they didn't catch anything. And then Jesus shows up and says, throw your net on the right side of the boat. And when they do, the net fill up with fish and they recognize that's Jesus on the shore. Well, there's another part in that story in John chapter 21. Now here's what happens. Jesus is standing there on the shore. And you remember, Peter jumped out of the boat and swam the shore because he just wanted to get close to Jesus. And the disciples in the boat, they finally got the boat in, trying to haul in all of these fish onto the shore. And Jesus already has a fire going there on the beach. And he tells them to bring some of the fish with them. And uh, they begin to cook some of the fish. And it says he breaks the bread, which he often does with his disciples. And basically, they have breakfast there together. But then, and here's the part of the story I want to focus on today. Jesus takes Peter, and they just go for a walk along the, side, the, along the seashore there. I think it's very important in several reasons why Jesus takes Peter aside from all the rest of the disciples. Jesus really knows and understands that all the events, the crucifixion, the resurrection, everything that's happening here has been much harder for Peter than all the rest of the disciples. Because remember, Peter is almost like Jesus' right-hand man through these three years that, that the disciples are following him. And even Peter, amongst all the other disciples, saw Jesus as the Messiah coming to establish an earthly kingdom. But that wasn't what he was going to do. It didn't turn out the way that they expected it to happen. And Peter's really dealing with all of this emotionally. And I like to point those things out because these are the humanness parts of these stories that we often overlook. And as I said last week, these disciples are just as human as you and I are. But there's also the fact that Peter, on the night that Jesus was on trial, when Peter had said he would stand by Jesus no matter what, he ended up denying ever knowing who he was. And that's an added level of grief for Peter. <clears throat> you see, we all look back at the resurrection now and rejoice, and we should. This is a great thing. This is a great victory. It's a great act of love on the part of God for us. But if you were the disciples watching the crucifixion, that was a very difficult time. Even following that in the resurrection, seeing Jesus alive, it's, it's exciting, but it's strange as well. This just doesn't make sense. That was a very, very difficult time for those disciples. <clears throat> so Jesus just wants to get alone with Peter. And Jesus has a way of always just kind of cutting to the heart of the problem in the situation. And he just asks Peter, Peter, do you love me? That's really the essence of what Peter's struggling with. Yes, I love you, Lord. But how do I deal with all of these events that have taken place? How do I deal with it myself? I know that I love you, but then I denied you when you really needed me. <clears throat> how do I make sense of everything that's going on? How can I say I love you when I didn't stand by you? Jesus knows that's the turmoil that's going on inside of Peter. That's why I ask him, do you love me? And Peter says, yes. And Jesus said, then feed my lamb. And they just keep on going, and Jesus asks him again, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I love you. And he says, intend my flock. There is this flock and these lamb keep coming up here. Remember, Jesus is the good shepherd. The sheep are those who follow him. So the sheep he's referring to here are those followers, those people that have been with them mostly through these entire three years. 
The disciples were the closest ones to him. But remember, every time Jesus is speaking, there's always a large crowd of people. They followed him wherever he went. That's who Jesus is talking about. Take care of my followers. And the lambs, well, they're the offsprings of the sheep. Take care of my followers. Take care of those who are coming after them because those lambs are going to grow up to become sheep as well and they're going to have lambs. <clears throat> Take care of those who are added in that the sheep bring in, my followers bring in to this gospel message, into this kingdom. Take care of them, Peter. And then Jesus asked him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And John tells us that Peter is getting a little bit frustrated at this point because Jesus has asked him three times. But I think by the third time is when Peter is finally able to say, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus says again, then take care of my sheep. See, I think that what Jesus is doing by asking three times and really getting to the heart of the matter, in this encounter between Jesus and Peter, Jesus has fastened the torch onto Peter. He's saying, Peter, it's your turn now. It's time for you to take over. You're the rock, Peter. Remember, you're the rock upon which I'm going to build my church. Yes, Peter, you. The one who said you would be by my side no matter what, but ended up denying me. You're the one on whom I'm going to build this church. You who've been nothing but a fisherman most all of your life and are now fishing for men. It's you, Peter. It's you. <clears throat> Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I love you, Lord. Then take care of my flock. Because the, the responsibility is now yours. Now, I want to focus on that real question that Jesus has for Peter when he says, Peter, do you love me? And on that word love. Because he really paid close attention to what Jesus is doing here. As he's asked, when he asks him, do you love me? He's telling Peter what to do. When Peter says, yes, I love you, then here's what you need to do, Peter. You need to take care of my followers. That's an important part, not just of this story, but of the whole concept of love itself. Because you see, the word love is a verb. And you who are watching, if you remember back to your elementary school days, you remember studying grammar, a verb is a word that shows action. Love is what we do. It's not a feeling. Now, yes, there may be people we're fond of, people that we are close to, people that we have a special bond with. There may be feelings of love, but that's not what love is. Love is a verb. Love is what we do. Stephen Covey, in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, tells this story, and I think his story here gets to the heart of my point better than I ever could. <clears throat> It's in the section where Stephen is talking about being proactive. And at the end of one of his seminars, a man comes up to him and says, all this stuff you're saying is great, but every situation seems to be different. I wish you could help me and my wife with our marriage. It just doesn't seem like we feel the same way for each other as we used to do. Those feelings or love just aren't there anymore between us. And Stephen asks him, so the feelings are gone? And the man says, yes. And Stephen says, well, here's what you need to do. You need to go home tonight and love her. And the man said, but you don't understand. The feelings aren't there anymore. <clears throat> and Stephen says, well, if the feelings aren't there anymore, there's a reason why they're not there. You need to go home and love her. And the man said, well, how do you love when you don't feel love? And Stephen's response is, the feelings of love is just the fruit of love itself. Love is what we do. Go home and love your wife. Go home and listen to her. Go home and help her. Sacrifice. Be affirming. Be authentic with her. Care about the things that she cares about. Love is what you do. It's not a feeling. And so Jesus is telling Peter, here's what you need to do because of this love that you have for me. You know, there's a song that we've sung <clears throat> several times here at Centenary. 
they'll know we are Christians by our love. Another way of saying it is, they will know we are Christians by what we do. Think about it, just because you have feelings for someone doesn't mean anything to them. They can't see your feelings. What they see is what you do. They're not going to know we are Christians by how we feel. They're not going to know we are Christians by what we don't do, maybe in an indirect way. They're going to know we are Christians by what we do. Love is about what we do. <clears throat> Think about that through the week. Love is what we do. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father in heaven, we rejoice that you are love. <clears throat> Help us, Father, to grasp the idea that love is what we do and how we treat those around us and how we take care of the flock that you've given us to shepherd. Thank you, Father, for uh, the youth here who, who are watching the video and pray for them as they're moving back into the school setting and learning from home. <clears throat> we pray, Father, for your continued guidance through this pandemic time. We thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus Christ, for the great sacrifice that he made on our behalf and all the wonderful things that he taught us throughout his time here on earth. We love you, God, and we pray, God, for your blessings upon our church and about, upon everyone who is watching our video here today. Through Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Have a safe week. We'll see you next time.